When it comes to extravagance, few monarchs can compete with George IV. His coronation banquet was arguably the most over-the-top feast ever held. Historian Dr. Matthew Green is treading in the footsteps of this, the most famous royal eater. Supposedly known as Old Naughty, Prince George finally got his hands on power when his father, George III, descended into his final spell of madness in 1811. At his beloved royal pavilion in Brighton, the Prince Regent had a reputation for laying on the most extravagant banquets. So it's no surprise his coronation was the biggest feast in history. Hi, David. Hello. How are you? Very well, thank you. A fantastic place. Isn't it astonishing? David Beavers is keeper of the royal pavilion and is taking Matt to the grand banqueting room, which gives some idea of George's dining habits. Wow. Look at this. This is, you often hear historical buildings described as mesmerizing and opulent, uh, but this really takes the biscuit. Yeah, it is one of the most astonishing rooms in England. It was finished in about 1818, 1819, um, and is a sort of monument to George's love of food and overindulgent. So to modern sensibilities, this seems almost unimaginably lavish, uh, but in George's world, this wasn't kind of the scene of his most lavish banquet. That took place elsewhere, didn't it? It did at Westminster Hall in 1821 after the coronation. So that was his coronation banquet? Coronation banquet. 1821. He decided not to have it here. Why was yeah, that? Well, because traditionally the coronation banquets were held in Westminster Hall, but his okay. was the last. It was the greatest and most spectacular coronation banquet in the whole of English history. George uh, turned it into, as, as here, a kind of fantasy vision of the world that he wanted it to, wow. to be. The expenditure was, it was around £240,000. £240,000. How much yeah. in today's money is that roughly equivalent to? Well, it's been computed to be about £20 million. £20 million. Yes. 350 people dined in the hall. Mm. Um, and I was a bit puzzled. 350 people, but 9,000 bottles of wine were assumed. 9,000. Wow, so now, how many is that each? Ah, but. Um, <laughs> uh, 350 dined in the hall, but 2,000 others dined in elsewhere in the Palace of Westminster, in the House of Lord, oh, okay. House of Commons in various other oh, so rooms these meals all over Westminster. There, there was all over the place. At the time of George's coronation, Britain was the richest, most powerful country in the world. Yes. And George wanted to make sure that he, as king, represented England. It's no surprise that George built the very finest kitchen, fit for a king and one of the most famous chefs of all time. So here we are in the kitchen. Wow, this is where the magic happens and my first impression of this is it's quite a show kitchen there's a great sense of space it's very well lit you've got those beautiful row of windows up there it's not as though it's been buried away so is, is that true is that the kind of place where people it's, come and watch the cooking? it's one of the first show kitchens and george was very proud of it George himself, when he was the regent or even when he was the king, would he have come down here? He famously came here on one and possibly two occasions. A red carpet was put on the, in, on the floor here. They laid a red carpet. They laid a red carpet and his chefs and scullions uh, served him. But there was for a time a celebrity chef who worked here as well. Um, who was he? Uh, Marie Antoine Carême. He liked to be called Antonine Carême. Uh, the most famous chef of all time, probably the first celebrity chef. So he was um, the, if you like, the sort of Jamie Oliver of the, the Jamie Oliver early of, 19th century. Yeah, absolutely. Um, he was recruited in Paris uh, by the Prince Regent. So it was quite a catch to get this absolutely. celebrity chef. Absolutely. Netted this man who cooked for Napoleon, cooked for the Tsar of Russia. It didn't work out in the long term, did it? He only lasted about a year. So no, he wrong? was here less than a year. What went wrong is partly the pavilion was a building site. It rained most of the time it was here. So he was working in a rain-lashed building site. Not very nice. But the main reason he, 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 he went back to France was that he was homesick. George may have lost his star chef, but his love of food grew and grew. His weight reached 20 stone and his waist 50 inches. I've got here an account uh, from the Duke of Wellington about George's almost last meal. And this is just a week or so before he died. And this is what he had for breakfast. Two pigeons, three beefsteaks, three quarters of a bottle of Moselle, a glass of champagne, two glasses of port, and a glass of brandy for breakfast. Wow. Now, one can either say what gross extravagance, or one could say what an appetite for life the man had. And if that was for breakfast, I dread to think what he had well, for dinner. 
The legacy of George's love of food lives on. A hundred years later, Buckingham Palace kitchen maid Mildred Nichols has recipes by royal chef Karem in her notebook, including this rich dessert.